and I pray you be with them in their situations and I pray that you just be with all of us here today, whether saved or unsaved, I pray that, that we'd hear the gospel this morning and we'd all get something from it. And I pray that in everything we do, say and think, it'd be your honor and your glory. I pray that we could be lights in this world and set the example for you, Lord. May I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And the instrumentalist in singing, because he lives, God sent his son. Faith. Welcome one another this morning.
was dead in the grave I was covered in sin and shame I heard mercy call my name He rolled the stone Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't. 
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, breathless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, please the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, breathless love of God All right. So, we did practice that <laughs> many times. And uh, that just happens sometimes, you know, when you get a group together. Sometimes a basketball team comes out, they had a play, and somebody doesn't do the right play. So that's how it works sometimes. We're glad you're here this morning, and we're glad that even when maybe we don't get it right the first time, God's love is always there. And we can count on it even when we cannot count on us sometimes. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. A new month, a new series on Sunday mornings. And so let's get our Bibles open to Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, we encourage you to use one of the ones there in the pew. And so you can turn with us to Acts chapter 17. That can be found on page 954 in the pew Bible. 954, Acts chapter 17. We are... Uh, asking for your prayers for our academy. School starts in just over, I guess, two weeks now, and, uh, or just a week and a half, I think. And um, So keep them in your prayers. And uh, we have a uh, record enrollment, uh, at least since in the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, quite a big enrollment. So uh, we could really use your prayers. We have um, still some staffing that we're trying to get in line. So pray for that if you would. Pray that we'll have a a year where the gospel will go out to all the students who are there and uh, we'll see young people saved and uh, making disciples for Jesus even in, in our academy there. And so we're thankful to God for the opportunity uh, to reach these families with Christ. And uh, uh, Have you ever experienced a layover? Have you ever been on a flight plan and, and uh, you had a layover? Um, those are not that exciting, you know. Um, Unless you get a lot of time, and then you can explore a little bit. Uh, layovers are unexpected and undesired stops in a trip. And I, I had one, one time when uh, I was making a site visit for a, a mission trip with our teenagers uh, years ago. We went to Vancouver, and the youth pastor and I were flying back, and we had to stop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, it was in the winter time, and the... Uh, the runway froze over, and so everything was shut down. You could not fly until the next morning. Hopefully, they would be able to de-ice everything, and we'd be able to fly out. So we landed at like uh, 2 in the afternoon, and uh, we had nothing to do. So uh, we rented a, a car and kind of drove around Salt Lake City to see the sites, kind of to... We checked out all the, you know, the Mormon Tabernacle and all of their buildings and all the things they've got going out, on out there. Uh, we were stuck, so we figured we'd find something to do and just learn a bit about the area and see it. Layovers are, are kind of undesired things, but you know, 
uh, in life, sometimes we get in what we might call a layover, a, a position, a circumstance, even maybe a relationship that uh, we didn't foresee coming, but we, we land there, you know. And this morning, uh, in the next couple of weeks, I guess three weeks, we're going to look at Paul when he had a layover in Athens. Uh, this took place about 50 A.D. Okay, Paul was in the middle of his second missionary journey. He went to Thessalonica to preach the gospel. And like Paul always did, he went into the synagogue first, the Jewish synagogue. And he would reason with the Jews out of the Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah. And he would preach that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And people would you know, come to know Christ, but many times, most of the Jews in the area did not believe and they thought Paul was preaching heresy and they would uh, either violently or otherwise run him out of the city. Well, that's what happened in Thessalonica. Then Paul's next stop was in a place called Berea. He came to Berea and preached the gospel. The Bible does note that the people in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in the fact that the Bereans actually searched the scriptures. When Paul was preaching, they were going through the Bible to check him out to see if what he was saying was actually true. So it says they were more noble than others. And Well, some people in Berea believed in Christ and some did not. But the Thessalonians, the ones who really got uptight with Paul and ran him out of Thessalonica, they got wind that Paul was in Berea preaching the gospel. So they sent a mob <laughs> to Berea to run him out of there too. And it got ugly for Paul. He had already had attempts on his life. He has been in a lot of trouble for preaching the gospel. So they ran him out of Berea too, and some of his friends and, and uh, fellow Christians decided, Paul, uh, you need to take a break, man. You know, this is getting pretty wild. We need to let you calm down a little bit. The people are getting worked up. So the idea was to send him south to Greece, a, a quieter part of the region uh, where thinking and uh, different ideas and philosophies were more welcomed. And so they sent him south to Greece, and as he sailed south, he came to a place called Athens. Athens, Greece. And his, his intent was to go to Corinth, because by this time, Athens had been past its golden age. And Corinth was really the booming city of commerce and where everything was happening in Greece. So really his desire was to go to Corinth, but he stopped in Athens, and the Bible says he waited for his friends to come and join him before he went on to Corinth. So what we're going to look at here is Paul's layover in Athens. We're going to see what he saw, what he thought, what he felt, what he said, and what he did. And I believe that as we look at Paul and what God allowed him to be involved in and where God set him for a time, I think we're going to see some parallels in our life. I think we may see ourselves in Paul and, and hopefully see the same kind of heart that Paul had in ourselves. And if not, may it be a conviction and a challenge uh, to us to see what Paul saw. All right, so let's take a look at the Word of God this morning. Acts chapter 17, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. And we're going to read this account of Paul in Athens, okay? Acts 17, beginning in verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers were, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, 
Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God, that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorant God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was Diocinus and the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this time we've had to gather together in your house on your day. Lord, we thank you for the songs that have turned our heart's attention toward you and the fact that you are alive and we've sung and heard of your great love for us, Lord. And now, Lord, as we turn our heart's attention towards the preaching of your word, I ask that you would empty me of sin and self. Lord, that you'd fill me with your spirit. Give me the unction of the Holy Ghost, please. Lord, I pray that your word and your spirit would make a difference in our hearts this morning. God, I ask for the convicting power on us, Lord, where we need to be convicted, that we'd be corrected and encouraged and instructed through your holy word. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today who's not saved, that they'll be saved today. And for those of us who know Christ, that we'll see with eyes of compassion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we read here in this account that Paul is brought to Athens by a few friends. And while he was there, he was waiting for Timothy and Silas to come join him. And then they'd continue their preaching tour, their missionary tour. So Paul's just sitting there in Athens. And according to verse 16, uh, as Paul was waiting, his, the Bible says his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So a layover, kind of just sitting around in Athens waiting, a moment of a pause in his plans of what he was going to do with and for the Lord. And I want us to see, first of all, this morning that uh, we're going to go where Paul went. Uh, has anybody ever been to Athens before? Just curious. Not Athens, Ohio. Athens, Greece. All right. Okay. Nobody. Okay. No one's been to Athens, Greece before. I haven't either in and uh, we're not going to probably go exactly where Paul went, but I think circumstantially where Paul went. You know, uh, kind of the waiting period, that, that time that we didn't really expect to be where we are in life, but we're there. Athens was a place of a lot of religion, but no witness of Jesus. And in a chaotic turn of events, it seemed like Paul, quote, found himself in Athens. And from what we know, he had no plans to really stay there. I wonder this morning, have you ever found yourself in a circumstance or with people that you never planned to be in? 
Have you ever found yourself in a, in a part of life or in a, in a stage of life or, uh, you know, God placed you in a particular issue and you never planned on being there? Maybe it was a health issue that, that came out of nowhere and it took you by surprise, you know, and you're like, what in the world? This was not in my plans. Perhaps it was a relationship that either came into your life or was broken, cut off. And you just never really planned on it. You know, maybe it was a, a loss of a job that you thought things were going great and all of a sudden your, your income is gone. Maybe it was a loss of a loved one who, who you did not expect to leave you as soon as they did. Whatever it is, we've all found ourselves in places that we didn't see coming and we didn't have any plans of being there. And this is kind of where Paul is. He's in a place that you wouldn't search for. You wouldn't particularly go out of your way to be in. You know, it's in these moments of our lives where we find out a lot about ourselves and about God if we care to engage him. You see, these, these layovers in life, they can be, they can seem awfully abrupt and unforeseen and even horrible. And, and not in the plans and, and kind of a, an, a, an issue or even an aggravation. And you just want to move on with your life. You want to keep going where you were going, where you had planned to be, but you're stopped. You're laying over somewhere. You know, a good, time to, a good question to ask in times like these is this, God, for what purpose have you placed me here? Now, that we understand the heart of the attitude, right? We, not the kind of attitude that says, God, why have you done this to me in anger? But the, the heart that says, Lord, you've placed me here, and why? What am I supposed to see while I'm here? Is there something I'm supposed to hear while I'm in this circumstance? Is there someone I'm supposed to meet? Is there a message I'm supposed to give? Is there a person I'm supposed to help? You see, these are good things to ask of the Lord when we find ourselves in a spot we didn't really plan on being in. Because listen, detours in our lives are not accidental. God didn't wake up one morning and go, Oh no, I didn't realize Phil was going to be there today. He didn't fall asleep and forget where we were going. He didn't forget for a moment, maybe he was paying attention to someone over here and all of a sudden you wound up and he's like, oh no, no, God's in control of everything. God knows exactly where you are. And friends, sometimes he allows us to take layovers. A pause in our journey where we were headed because he has something there for us or Perhaps he has us there for something or someone. Detours are not accidental. Do you think God put Paul in Athens for a purpose? Of course he did. I mean, if we, we read verse 34, but if you peek down in verse 34, it even names some people who trusted Christ. Yeah, so God was there on purpose. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't an oversight on God's behalf where he just forgot about Paul for a minute. God had Paul in Athens to witness of Jesus. And God has put you in your circumstance for a purpose also. Whether you're heading down the, pa the path of your plans or maybe you're in a layover right now. Wherever you are, God has you there for a purpose. You know, Paul found himself in a city steeped in religious activity. It was an opulent place. State-of-the-art temples built to gods of all types. Shrines, statues, and monuments everywhere you looked. This would be the last place on earth a Jewish Christian would want to be. And, and I mean, clearly... This is against everything that Jews and Christians believe. This is not the kind of place you would want to spend time. Athens also was a place of uh, liberal higher education. 
Everything was questioned, and nothing was out of bounds if it brought education or pleasure. And it amazes me how many times we see in the Bible that God's people found themselves in places like this. I mean, just off the top of our heads, we think of people like Abraham and Joseph, you know, Moses, in places that they would have never dreamed of being. But God had them there for a purpose. God has you where you are for a purpose. And friend, the question is, are you trying to find out what God wants for you or has for you there? Is there a person to reach? Is there a message to give? Is there something to hear or see? We need to be perceiving what God is doing because, friend, nothing is accidental with God. So what do we do while we're waiting? See that in verse 16? Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens. What do you do when you're waiting? You know, Paul could have gone down to the market and, and got a euro or, you know, uh, had a, what other Greek food? Baklava, you know. Uh, he could have done any of that. He, maybe he went and, and toured all the, all the sites of, you know, i, I got to go see the Parthenon and all these. Paul was waiting. And the Bible tells us something happened to him while he was waiting. It wasn't that he had to try the best food or see all the sights. Something happened in Paul's heart while he waited. Paul's compassion for people and the souls of the lost overshadowed his frustrations and self-preservation. Something happened when Paul was waiting in Athens. He didn't sit there and fold his arms and, you know, bite his cheeks and think, oh, frustrating. Why do I have to be in Athens? I want to be in Corinth preaching the gospel. Why am I sitting here? You know, layovers are no fun. In fact, I've seen some pretty ugly things happen during layovers. You know, you got the, the, the people who are up talking to the gate agent, screaming and yelling is, you know, making all kinds of chaos because they missed their flight or they need to get home or they need to get here and, and they're just going nuts and going crazy and, and mad because of a layover. Really, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> if you're there, you're there. A layover is not a place we would desire to be. But when we're there, when we're waiting, what's going on in our hearts? When we're placed in a circumstance we didn't plan on being in, what's going on in our hearts? Are we frustrated with God, mad that he placed us here? Or are we looking around and saying, okay, Lord, what, what, what do you have for me here? What am I supposed to see or hear or say or do? And Paul was alert to God's moving in his heart. Paul was the kind of guy who perceived what God was doing all the time. He was in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. He was in tune with his, with his uh, mission. He understood what he was placed on this earth for. And so Paul's there in Athens. He's at a layover. So sometimes God's going to take us where God took Paul. We're going we're to sit for a while. We're going to wait. And then, number two, sometimes we're going to see what Paul saw. We're going to see what Paul saw. Look at verse 16 again. Now, while... Paul waited for them in Athens. His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. He looked around Athens and saw nothing but idols and people who worshipped idols. You know, Christians are supposed to see things differently than everybody else. We're supposed to see with different eyes than everybody else in this world. And Paul was seeing something that nobody else was seeing there. At this time, when Paul's visit happened, the temple to Zeus was only about halfway completed. But at the Acropolis, which is really just the words high city, the highest part of Athens, and really the highest part of any city in Greece, they would build a temple to the patron god of that city. And so at the Acropolis, at the top of Athens, there was the Parthenon. And this was a beautiful, one-of-a-kind, architectural, uh, you know, 
something unbelievable the world has never seen, to the goddess Athena, the patron god of Athens. Inside this temple was a 40-foot ivory statue that was embellished with precious uh, stones and metals of this goddess Athena. And people would go there to worship this idol. Towering pillars stood out as you entered the city. At the very highest point was this white, opulent temple to this god. Sacrifices and altars everywhere. As you wandered through the the streets of Athens, it's estimated that there were 30,000 different gods that you could worship in Athens. 30,000 different gods. Gods of all types, kinds, and oversight. In fact, the terminology used here in verse 16, when it says, holy given to idolatry, you know that term, I'm not going to try to say what the Greek word is, but it really means a forest of idols. A forest of idols. Everywhere you looked, idols. Think about America. Are there any places in America where where you go, it seems like there's a forest of something other than a forest, right? Okay, (laughs) let's get that out of the way. But, I mean, you walk into a city or an area, and you are overwhelmed with something. I thought of a couple places. Uh, I've never been to Las Vegas, but from the video and images I've seen and from the people that I've talked to who have been there, it's a forest of casinos and what is called gentlemen's clubs. Just a forest. The people that I know who've walked through uh, Las Vegas say that every few steps you take, someone is handing you a piece of paper with uh, pornographic images on it, inviting you to a certain club. Or there's some kind of a, here, take a chip to the casino and come on in and take your, uh, try your luck. It's a forest of gambling and immorality. You're just overwhelmed by it, from what I've heard. Now, I have been to New York City. I remember the first time we flew, flew into New York City, Dad and I went, and, and uh, we were flying in, and, and we came across Manhattan there, the island. It is an entire island of skyscrapers. The whole island is skyscrapers, except for that one little spot in the middle of Central Park. But everywhere you look, huge buildings. That's all there is. Specifically, have you ever been to Times Square? Everywhere you look, video advertisement boards. Everywhere. You can't look anywhere without something flashing a message. It's overwhelming. If you're there at night, it'll all about, you know, bug you out. It's unbelievable. You couldn't possibly take it all in. You're overwhelmed with it. That's what Athens was like with idols, false gods, these memorials built to false gods. Paul's walking through and seeing this forest of idols. One person even said... Uh, a writer from back in that time even said it was easier to find an idol than a man in Athens. And as Paul walks through, he's seeing something. He's looking at these idols and his heart is stirred. He's, he's seeing people worshiping stone and metal. And he made a distinction when he saw this. These weren't just memorials built to leaders. You know, like you go to Washington, D.C., right? And there's the Lincoln Memorial. Most people don't worship that, okay? It's a memorial. It's built to an individual in our history who was impactful in our country. So they built a memorial. There's a difference between an idol and a memorial, okay? And when Paul said, look at that word in verse 16. When Paul said idolatry, he's talking about the kinds of statues that were built for the purpose of worship. A whole different thing. And he sees this, and his eyes are having a difference in him, making a difference in his heart. And although the architecture was beautiful and astounding, Paul was seeing it differently than everybody else. His eyes affected his heart. Has that ever happened to you? Do you ever see something that we say pulled on our heartstrings? Do you ever see something that caused you to feel 
emotion. Maybe you'll watch a, a movie where, you know, something sad happens. The, the, the person everybody loves in the movie dies, you know, Old Yeller or whatever. You know, you, you're watching the movie and something, and, and you watch this and it affects your heart. I think about in our town, when you pull up to a intersection, sometimes there's individuals standing there with signs asking for help. I wonder, Christian, does it still affect our heart? Do our eyes affect our heart? Do what we see get here? Or have we put up some blocks that says, you know what? No. And when we look at across the street and we see a, a church, a Catholic church, or we, we look at people going through this life Worshipping idols of all kinds. Does it affect our heart? I'm afraid it does. I'm afraid that many times what we see affects our heart in this way. It makes us angry. What does it make us angry about? Because you know, there's here it says that Paul's heart was stirred. And that means that he was a little, uh, we use the phrase righteous indignation. He was, he was kind of angry. Now, I want us all to listen very carefully to this. Because we Christians sometimes use the term righteous indignation in the wrong way. Okay? We think we're allowed to be mad at everything because we're Christians. Time out. Paul was mad, angry, stirred, provoked, number one, and, and chiefly, because here's a whole town worshiping false gods and the true God was not being worshipped. Jesus is not known in this place. He's not mad at the people. Listen carefully to this. Paul was mad at the enemy. The enemy is Satan. And he had blinded the eyes of the Athenians. Listen, there were so many idols and so much religion that there was no room for Jesus. And that is what made Paul angry. He wasn't mad at the sinners. He was mad at the enemy because he had blinded the eyes of these people and told them that there's thousands and thousands of gods. When that's not the truth, that upset Paul. He was upset because God's glory was not. At the top of the, t of the, of the city there was a, a statue to a goddess Athena. Not a house of praise to God, the true God. That, that provoked his heart. So it made him mad in that sense. So listen, we're allowed to be mad at Satan. And we're allowed to be mad at sin, by the way. Hello, including ours. But man, Paul wasn't mad at the people. His eyes affected his heart. He was angry at Satan and had compassion on the people. He was so concerned that these people know Jesus, he couldn't sit around anymore and wait. He couldn't wait any longer. He couldn't sit and enjoy the architecture. He couldn't sit and enjoy the new food. He had to do something. He was stirred. And instead of being mad at the religious lost, he told him about Jesus. Friends, it's time that you and I had the right emotion towards those who don't know Christ. I understand that there's all kinds of things being said in our country and all kinds of things being done in our country that we do not agree with. But what we as God's people cannot do is confuse who the enemy is. The enemy, I'm just going to say it, is not the Democratic Party. And you can take that and leave it if you, if you don't like it. But the enemy is not the Democratic Party. Some of us need to turn off Fox News and get in the Word and go out and tell people about Christ. Amen. The enemy is not uh, all the, the people who are what we would say doing the greater sins. 
the enemy is Satan. He has always been the enemy of men's souls. It's okay to be mad at him. We should be. And we should be mad at our own stinking sin. We should have a heart of compassion for those people who are just like you and me. But for the grace of God, we'd be without Christ. Where's the heart that when I see somebody who may be doing something that I completely disagree with says, but Jesus died for that soul. And I need to love them and share the gospel with them. Where's that heart? Our American Christianity and, and, and Central Baptist Church, we as a people, myself included, we need that heart, our hearts stirred. We need a revival of compassion in our hearts for the people around us dying and going to hell. We do. We need to have our hearts stirred within us that when we look at them, when we see them with our eyes, it stirs something in us that says, I can't sit around anymore and just let this happen. I need to tell them about the one true God. And so would we pray, would we dare ask God to give us a heart of compassion? Would we dare ask God to give us a love for people's souls that would cause us to do something about it? Other than pray for our missionaries and put a few bucks in the plate for the missionaries, would we dare ask God to do something in our own hearts that we would see? Not ugly, sinful things, but precious souls that Jesus died for. See, Paul went somewhere he never expected to be. And Paul saw some things he probably didn't want to see. But he let God guide his path. Will we? If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. I wonder this morning, when you came in this room, now go with me on this, when you came in this room this morning, did you bring with you a waiting period? Maybe today you're somewhere, circumstantially, you never thought you'd be. You're facing something you never thought you'd face, you're seeing things you never thought you'd see, and you're wondering why. Why am I here? What am I doing? Let's turn the question around and say, Lord, what do I need to see? What do I need to hear? Is there something I need to say? Is there someone I need to help? Is there something I need to do? Instead of looking around with frustration, why don't we look up to the Lord and say, okay, God, I'm here. I'm not what I planned on. But you know I'm here. Teach me. Why am I here? What do I need to do? Would you talk to him about that this morning? Maybe you came in this morning and you're, you're seeing a world that's just full, full of awful things, full of false gods, full of things that promise but never deliver. And you're, you're sick of it and you're tired of it, would you ask God to give you a different viewpoint? Instead of seeing the things we're mad about and sick of, and say, Lord, help me to see with the eyes of Jesus. Help me to see the souls, these precious people who need you. Help me to see that, Lord, and then give me the, the compassion to do something. Would you talk to him about that today? Maybe you're here today and maybe you're the one who's searching. You're, you're, you're not even sure where you're going to go when you die. You're, that's a question mark in your mind. What's going to happen to me when I die? Well, the good news is that Jesus Christ is the true God. He is the Savior of the world. 
He's the answer to all of our brokenness. What sin has ruined in our lives, Jesus can heal. Why? Not because he came to this earth as a man. And he lived the life that God intended for all of us to live. He never sinned. And so that because of his sinless life, he decided to die in our place. He took the penalty we deserve for our sins upon himself. And if we believe in him, he'll give us his record, his perfect sinless record. And we'll be restored to God and that relationship with him and have eternal life. So today the option is yours, the choice is yours. Would you choose today to change your mind and trust Jesus? Would you just call out to him right now, right where there you are in your pew, and maybe just quietly you'd bow your head and say, God, I'm, I'm ready to turn to you. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I failed. My guilt and my regret tells me I'm broken. And all the ways I've tried to fix this are not working. And so I'm just asking you, to forgive me and save my soul. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the dead and made a way for me to have everlasting life. Jesus, I trust you. Would you pray and ask the Lord to save you right now? Our folks are going to sing. They're going to sing this verse. And as they sing, why don't you just talk to God?